The political map of Italy looked like a mosaic until the middle of the 19th century. The north was under the influence of Austria, which included the rich regions of Lombardy and Venice. The Bourbons ruled in the south, in the kingdom of the two Sicilies. The Papal States in the center had a special sacred status for more than a thousand years, and it seemed that it would continue to exist for another thousand. During the Napoleonic Wars, France tried to change the balance of power in Italy, which gave the northern provinces the hope of liberation from the Austrian rule, but only for a short time. For the supporters of the idea of a single Italian state, it was difficult to even imagine how the existing order could change in the foreseeable future. Only the Sardinian Kingdom retained its independence from foreign rulers, and that was the place where the liberation movement would begin, the Risorgimento, or Renewal, the symbol of which will be Giuseppe Garibaldi. He was born in 1807 in Nice, then part of the Sardinian Kingdom. From childhood, the son of a sailor, Garibaldi aspired to a career as a naval officer. At the age of 15 he gets a job in the merchant fleet, and at the age of 25 he becomes the captain of the merchant ship. Maximalism and heightened sense of justice, as well as extraordinary courage, which sometimes seemed to border on recklessness, led him in 1833 to join the secret society Young Italy. By the way, this happened in Russia, in Taganrog, where his ship was located at that moment. Having met the politician in exile Giovanni Battista Cuneo there, Garibaldi caught fire with the revolutionary idea of liberating Italy from foreign rule and uniting it. In the late 20s of the 19th century, a significant part of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies was engulfed in civil disorder. The revolutionary movement that broke out in Naples in 1820 was suppressed with the help of Prussia, Austria and Russia. These events prompted Garibaldi to participate in the uprising prepared by Young Italy in Piedmont. The rebellion failed and many organization members were executed or, like Garibaldi, sentenced to death in absentia. Hiding from persecution, he decided to leave his homeland and go to South America. The newly formed South American states were just in the process of defining borders, so Garibaldi plunged into the thick of the revolutionary liberation movements. Shortly after his arrival, he joined the army of the Rio Grande's Republic, which fought for independence from Brazil. At first, Garibaldi acted as a simple corsair, attacking Brazilian ships. Three years later, he became an admiral and commanded the entire Republic fleet, however a tiny one. At this time, he met his future wife, Anita Ribeiro, who would accompany him on all campaigns and even personally participate in battles. The resistance of Rio Grande's Republic was eventually crushed by the Brazilians. Garibaldi destroyed his fleet so that the enemy would not get it, and in 1841 he moved to Uruguay. There he took part in the civil war on the side of liberals against conservatives. Garibaldi gathered his compatriots around him and formed the Italian Legion. It was then that the red shirts became the hallmark of his warriors. Meanwhile, during the forced absence of Garibaldi, the revolutionary movement in Italy gained strength again. The wave of European revolutions of 1848 also covered the Italian peninsula. Plus, a war broke out between the Austrian Empire and the Kingdom of Sardinia. These events prompted Garibaldi to return. With a small detachment of comrades, who were accommodated by just one ship, he sailed towards Italy. But while Garibaldi got there and then recruited a corps of volunteers on behalf of the Sardinian king, the revolutionary fuse gradually dried up and the Sardinian army was defeated by the Austrians. Garibaldi, however, decided to fight to the last. After several battles with the Austrians, he returned to Nice where he began to form a new volunteer legion. He now refused to cooperate with the Sardinian government, and in December 1848 he arrived in Rome with a recruited detachment. Recently there was an uprising against the papal authority, and the Roman Republic was proclaimed. Garibaldi for some time defended Rome from an entire enemy coalition. French troops landed from the sea the Austrians approached from the north, and the army of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies came from the south. But the forces under his command were few, and they couldn't hold out for long. In 1849, the power of Pope was restored. 
Garibaldi, however, went with his detachment to the north of Italy, where the recently proclaimed Republic of San Marco still held. At this time, his wife Anita died, unable to withstand the harsh conditions of the march. This campaign also failed. Venice, the last stronghold of the revolution, surrendered to the Austrian troops. After finding this out, Garibaldi, with a small group of like-minded people, broke through to the Sardinian kingdom, where he was arrested and exiled outside the country. He lived in Tunisia and Morocco, then moved to the United States, where he even worked in a factory, until he returned to his former occupation, sailing on a merchant ship. He was skeptical about new attempts by the Italian politicians to raise an uprising, and was not going to get involved in the fight just for the sake of fighting. Five years after the second exile, Garibaldi returned to Italy and settled on the island of Caprera near Sardinia. He was 47 years old. He was already a hero of two continents and a living legend, and it seemed that only a well-earned retirement was ahead of him. But, as it turned out, all this was only a precursor of his main deeds. In 1859, a new war with Austria began. This time, the Kingdom of Sardinia enlisted the support of France, intending to take away the Austrian possessions on the Italian peninsula. In return, Napoleon III would take Nice and Savoy. The head of the government, Cavour, invited Garibaldi to recruit volunteers and join the fighting. He led the 3,000 volunteer corps with the rank of Major General of the Sardinian Army. The general carried out several successful operations in Lombardia, clearing it of the enemy's troops. But the fact that his hometown was handed over to France has upset Garibaldi very much. He even accused Cavour of making him a foreigner in his own country. Nevertheless, from a political point of view, the exchange fully justified itself. The victory over Austria raised long-standing discontent in the duchies of Tuscany, Parma and Modena, as well as in the Papal States. The central Italian provinces didn't want Austrian or French henchmen to rule them and preferred to merge into the Sardinian Kingdom. In this way, by 1860, half the path to the unification of Italy was completed. The Kingdom of the Two Sicilies was next in line, and Garibaldi played a decisive role in its subjugation. When another uprising against the power of the Bourbons broke out in Palermo, Giuseppe arrived there with a thousand of his volunteers. Unlike the first Roman expedition, this time he spoke on behalf of the Sardinian kingdom, to avoid accusation of self-will. In Sicily, Garibaldi's leadership and organizational talent were especially pronounced. He had a huge influence on the fighters, drawing them into the attack by his own example, and was also very popular among the peasant population. Despite the small number of his troops, he repeatedly sent them against the enemy's superior forces and won. With each success, more and more people joined Garibaldi's detachment. His famous phrase during one of the battles clarifies how important he considered his mission. Here we create Italy or die. Garibaldi brought Palermo under his control, despite the numerically superior garrison of the city, thanks to the support of the Sicilian inhabitants. After that, he announced the deposition of King Francis II and proclaimed himself dictator of the island. Now his troops outnumbered the remaining royal forces in Sicily, and it was not difficult to completely knock them out from there. Arriving on the island with a thousand soldiers, Garibaldi increased his army 20 times. In August 1860, a campaign against the remaining troops of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies began on the peninsula. By October of the same year, Garibaldi subjugated the entire south of Italy, consolidating his success with a victory at Valturno over a numerically superior enemy. After that, he resigned as a dictator and handed over the state to the Sardinian king. Garibaldi became famous all around the world. When the American Civil War broke out the same year, President Lincoln offered him to join the Army of the Northern States. However, the commander moved to Caprera again and did not even always visit the meetings of the Italian parliament, where he was elected. Without the annexation of Rome, his mission seemed unfinished to him, and in 1862 he decided to start a new campaign on his own. But this time his actions have caused a protest in the Sardinian kingdom, 
especially since Napoleon III wanted to protect the papal throne. Garibaldi was declared a rebel and Sardinian troops opposed and defeated him. Despite his independent disposition, the Sardinian government still appreciated Garibaldi. When after four years it was the time to recapture Venice from Austria, the army could not do without him. Leading the volunteer corps again and advancing in his usual manner, Garibaldi marched to the city of Trento and recaptured it from the Austrian troops. After this short war, the commander returned to Caprera, but the thoughts of Rome apparently did not give him rest. He made another attempt to march on the Eternal City in 1867. Meanwhile, the Italian government signed a convention with France on maintaining neutrality regarding the Papal States, so Garibaldi's actions were again seen as disobedience to the authorities. His army was driven back by the combined efforts of the French army and the troops of the Pope. The commander himself got under arrest. However, by this time, the idea of adding Rome to a united Italy was so popular among the masses that Garibaldi was soon released and exiled to his island. He devoted himself to writing books, primarily anti-church content aimed at propaganda against the Holy See. The long-awaited unification of the last Italian lands came true with the start of the Franco-Prussian War. France was defeated and Rome lost its main defender. The French garrison was withdrawn, which allowed the kingdom troops to take control of the city. But Garibaldi could not take part in this, because he was in disgrace after an unauthorized campaign. He still managed to take part in the Franco-Prussian war, though, on the side of France, showing his extraordinary generosity and open mindset. Despite all the disagreements with this country, Garibaldi was ready to help the French and led the defense of Dijon from the Prussian troops. In contrast to the whole course of the war, his actions were quite successful, which made Victor Hugo say, of all the generals who fought on the side of France, he is the only one who wasn't defeated. The great revolutionary spent his last years on his estate in Caprera, where he died in 1882. A united Italy was far from his ideals, but nevertheless, the main mission of his life was successfully completed. Garibaldi was a staunch democrat and a supporter of ordinary people, which made him a cult figure in revolutionary movements worldwide, including the USSR. There is Garibaldi Street in Moscow, Kharkiv and Rostov and Don, and a monument in Taganrog, where he once decided to devote his life to the unification of Italy.